Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, boy, y'all, off the low down there, can you? <laughs> Is there anything we can do to elevate those chairs for the alternate drawers? Uh, it's almost like they're in a well. Are y'all comfortable there? Okay, I want to be sure. Can you see all right? We'll try to do something to kind of raise you, a little box or platform in there, raise you up a little bit, if that's all right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would stand and raise your right hand to be sworn as drawers in this case. You and each of you do solemnly swear or affirm that you will well and truly try this case now before the court and a true verdict render, unless it's charged by the court or withdrawn by the parties. So help you God. All right, you may be seated. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, uh, the sheriff or one of the deputies will be passing out drawer identification uh, badges, and we ask that you wear those badges while you're in or around the courthouse. Uh, if you take them home, invariably people will forget to bring them back, so just leave them in the seat when you leave in the evening. Uh, you'll also be given pencil and paper or writing material to take notes. You're not required to take notes. You're not going to be tested on, on your recollection. Uh, well, that's not completely accurate. You, you, your recollection of the facts will certainly be extremely important. Um, and those notes should be your own personal property. And you may refer to them during your deliberations to refresh your own recollection. So you may, what I'm trying to say is you may take notes if you think it will be helpful. This will be... Uh, a four to five day, maybe a week or two week trial. So certainly notes that you take, you might find them to be helpful. And again, uh, they, they are for your personal rec uh, refreshing uh, your recollection of the events, not, not to uh, reflect, refresh your neighbor's recollection. Sheriff, you got paper ready for them? All right, gentlemen, uh, you've already told me for the record in chambers that you were, the state was ready to proceed and the defense was ready to proceed. That's correct, Your Honor. That's correct. All right, let me give the, the officers just a second to pass out the uh, paper so they won't interrupt or interfere with your opening statements, and then, then I'll allow you to proceed. Yeah, be just a minute. And to the ladies and gentlemen in the off, uh, audience, um, you probably noticed the no smoking signs. We, we've, uh, after consulting with the county judge, the county officials, uh, we've asked that the courthouse be declared non-smoking during this trial. And that's simply because of the number of people uh, that will be here. And, and we ask that you adhere to that decision. It, it shouldn't be necessary for me to, to remind anyone, but I, I don't want any audible uh, sound from the audience during any testimony or during any ruling of the court. If you have a comment, you just get up and go outside and make it, because I'm not going to tolerate it in here. It's not proper, and I think you know and understand that. So no outburst of any kind will be tolerated in or around the courtroom or, for that matter, on the courtyard. Uh, and it will be dealt with uh, strongly and appropriately. <coughs> Is there some question, gentlemen? Your Honor, I was asking them about uh, the rule, the question of the rule, and, and uh, we're going to be asking that, that uh, there be an exception made for the rule. Well, uh, you mean as to expert witnesses? That's correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, as to the particular expert they're talking about, it's, it's our opinion that you know, he could be excluded from the rule to hear any experts we might offer testify. But as far as anything to be gained from hearing the other testimony or anything that would bear on his opinion, it would be inappropriate for him to hear testimony just as it would other witnesses. No, no, that's not the law. The law is clear that experts are allowed to remain in the courtroom and hear the testimony. 
and they can base their testimony on what they hear in the courtroom. And we'd ask that uh, the exception be made for our experts. Well, if there are witnesses that can assimilate what they hear by way of testimony and use that information to uh, form an opinion, that's true. But what witnesses are you talking about that need to do that? Our psychologist, Your Honor. Appro approach the bench, gentlemen. I need these camera, these microphones cut off. Are they off? That's not the problem, Dan. What is it specifically he needs to hear in the courtroom? Everything. To form an opinion on Mr. Hoyt. He's going to testify as to <coughs> Mr. Miss Kelly's mental capability. He's going to testify as to what uh, his mental capability was possibly during the interrogation. And we feel that's very important to hear the testimony. And I don't know exactly when this is going to come in or when. What's that got <coughs> mental capability? What the witnesses will say? No, oh, what prejudice will the state have by allowing him to listen to the testimony? I don't, I don't I'm all. Judge, it's very important that Dr. Wilkins be confined to areas that his expertise actually applies to. And the state considers that, that, that they're attempting to range far beyond his area of expertise. Judge, they can bring that up at the proper time. Do you want to let me finish? Sure. Okay. If they are allowed to, put, to have him listen to all the testimony, then he is going to get into areas that we feel like clearly go beyond his expertise. And, and what we anticipate they're going to do is talk about it. Uh, based on what he's seen or observed, how the officers influenced him. And that's clearly not something he can give an opinion on. Judge, he can give an opinion on that, and they, they can challenge that at the appropriate time when he testifies, but now is not the time to do that. You know, Mr. Stidham has indicated to the court that the only thing that he'll be giving opinions on is the defendant's mental capacity, either now or at the time that the question occurred. And I don't see how anything he heard in the courtroom could affect his opinion on the defendant's uh, mental capacity. Judge, what are they afraid of? What are they, what are, are they afraid he's going to hear something that he, uh, I just want to make it clear that he should be able to hear all the testimony if, if there's anything that he hears. I'm going to let him stay in. Thank you, Your Honor. You got anything you want to stay in? Thank Is that the only know. one? Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> you want the witnesses sworn at this time? Those that are here? You, it it raises doesn't make any difference, Your Honor, when you do it. All right, you may uh, state your case. Uh, state your case. May it please the court, Mr. Stidham, Mr. Crow, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the stage of trial in which the attorneys for each side, myself on behalf of the state and either Mr. Stidham or Mr. Crow on behalf of the defense, get an opportunity to come before you and, and talk to you a little bit and explain to you what evidence is expected to come before you and what issues or questions you'll be asked to resolve in reaching your verdict. <clears throat> Our purpose in giving opening statements is to aid and assist you, the jury, to help you uh, to assist you in understanding <coughs> the issues or questions that you're going to be asked to resolve in reaching your verdict. If you'll recall, in, in the jury selection process, we talked about the fact that the state had to prove the elements of the offense. Well, the issues or questions that you're going to be asked to resolve <coughs> relate to those elements of the offense. You know, were the elements met? Uh, and there will be, in general, there will be two elements, and I'll get to those a little uh, bit more in a minute. But basically, there will be two elements, and you'll be, those are the issues or questions that you're going to have to resolve in your mind about whether the state has proven those things in order to reach a verdict. The second purpose is to provide you uh, some indication, some uh, preview of what we expect that the evidence is going to be in this case. Now, some lawyers describe the trial of a of any kind of lawsuit civil criminal or whatever is like putting the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together now any of you who have ever put together a jigsaw puzzle know unless you have the completed picture beside you as you put those pieces together 
it's almost impossible to put the pieces together because you don't know what the completed picture looks like. Well, this opening statement is like that completed picture. It gives you a frame of reference, something to look back on as each witness testifies or each exhibit comes in as to where that particular piece of evidence fits into the overall picture of the case. In this case, the defendant is charged with three counts of capital murder. In order for you to return a verdict of guilty for capital murder, in order for us to prove our case, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and this is what I expect the judge will instruct you at the appropriate time, number one, that this defendant or an accomplice, somebody that he's helping or assisting, caused the death of, on one of the counts, Michael Moore, on another of the counts, Stevie Branch, and on another of the counts, Chris Byers. That's the first issue or question that you will be asked to resolve in reaching your verdict. Has the state proven that this defendant or an accomplice caused the death of these three boys? The second issue or question that you're going to have to be, you're going to be asked to resolve in reaching your verdict, or the second element that the state has to prove, is that when these murders occurred, when the deaths were caused, of Michael Moore and Stevie Branch and Chris Byers that the defendant or the accomplice had the premeditated and deliberated purpose of doing so. Now what's the evidence going to be? <coughs> no, you're not. If you would, I want you to, to just kind of think back uh, May the 5th, 1993. On May the 5th, 1993, Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Chris Byers were in school at Weaver Elementary School in the second grade. All of them eight years old. After they got out of school, uh, they're all friends. Uh, at some point after getting out of school, uh, Stevie Branch goes over to Michael Moore's house, and Michael and Stevie, they're both on their bicycles. Uh, one of them has a, Michael has a um, green bicycle, and Stevie has a red and black bicycle, and they're riding around the neighborhood uh, just doing what eight-year-old kids do, just playing. Well, about um, somewhere around six o'clock, Michael's mother is outside and she sees Michael on his bicycle and Stevie on his bicycle and they've joined up with Chris Byers who lived across the street from Michael and I believe the proof is going to show that Chris is riding on the bicycle with Stevie and they're heading north on Goodwin. Now this is an aerial photograph and this shows part of Goodwin is this street right here, and they were heading north on Goodwin, headed toward this area, which is referred to by the kids as Robin Hood area. And on the photograph, you'll be able to see all the, the <coughs> trails and things that the kids ride their bikes on and play. And this area here, this wooded area here, uh, the proof's going to show is an area that's called Robin Hood Hills. <coughs> And it's a wooded area, and believe it or not, in Crittenden County, there's some, some higher elevations and lower elevations, and it's a place, a wooded area. I guess it's the, the kids' Sherwood Forest. It's where the kids play and uh, do what kids do. This is the Interstate Highway, I-55. This is what's called the Blue Beacon Truck Wash. First one to show that this is a Love's Truck Stop right here. This is all residential area in here. Well, the proof's going to show, as I said, that Dana Moore saw these boys heading on these two bicycles, headed north on Goodwin Street. And she sent her daughter to you know, go get them. It's time for supper. It was about 6 o'clock. And the daughter couldn't catch up to them. And uh, later, I think a neighbor, who uh, somebody that lives on, I believe it's this circle right here, 
in one of these houses saw the kids headed toward that area. They'd been kind of riding through a yard, and she said, you know, y'all don't ride in my yard, y'all don't run over my trees. And the last they were seen, they were headed toward this area. That was the last time that the kids were seen alive that we know of. <coughs> now, sometime a little bit later, I believe the Byers family, uh, Chris wasn't supposed to be out there. He was supposed to have been at home, I think, maybe cleaning up the garage or something, and he wasn't supposed to be out there. And uh, when Mr. Byers gets home, uh, the wife's there, and they see that uh, Chris is not there, and after a period of time, they begin to look. Uh, a little bit later, the moors begin to look and can't find the kids. You know, they're going around the neighborhood. Now, at this time, um, Stevie Branch's mother was working at Catfish Island, which is a restaurant over near the interstate, and um, her husband was at home, and he had begun to look. Well, the parents begin to get a little frantic, and they end up spending a, really a frantic night of searching for these kids. Um, they search and search and search, and they don't find their children. Well, <clears throat> on May the 6th, 93, the, there's a full-scale search out. Uh, people searching all over, not only in this area, but uh, all over anywhere you know, the, the kids might possibly be. Sometime around 1 o'clock, in this area, and in this area, by the way, the proof's going to show that there's a, a creek that uh, I use the term loosely for our area because it's some kind of a drainage ditch, but it, it's more like a creek, flows through this wooded area into, this is a major drainage canal right here, and it flows into that somewhere about right in here. Now, right here, and of course you can't see it from there, but there's a large pipe that the kids used to cross this ditch to get into this wooded area. Now, the proof's going to show that sometime around one o'clock the next day, the uh, police get a call that, you know, somebody needs to come out here, and one of the officers goes out to this area, and they're floating in the water in this creek, has about two and a half, maybe two and a half feet of water, maybe knee-deep water. He sees a tennis shoe and maybe a couple of tennis shoes. And he tries to cross over to the other side where he thinks that he can get to it and falls in the water. And uh, you'll actually even see photographs of before he actually got in the water and then where he fell in the water. And then he gets up and goes around and he gets back into the water to get this tennis shoe and, and see whether it's something that might mean something. And as he's going toward the tennis shoe, his foot hits something. And he lifts up his foot, Michael Moore's body comes up. At this point, the scene is secured. The uh, other investigators are called, and they try to get all the searchers out of the area who've been searching all over the place. And they begin a search of the area. They remove Michael's body. He's nude, he's tied uh, hand to foot with, with the shoe strings out of the shoes from left hand to left foot and right hand to right foot. And one of the officers has to get down and inch by inch go through that creek. And they find, they found the Cub Scout hat, one of the Michael, uh, was a big Cub Scout and he liked to wear his uniform a whole lot and was wearing his Cub Scout shirt and his hat that day. And uh, Anyway, they find the Cub Scout hat. They find the other shoes. They find the kids, some of the kids' pants, and I believe at least two pair of the pants were turned completely inside out and, and, and snapped. They were inside out, but they were snapped. He continues down, and as he goes down about... I don't remember. It was some distance from where Michael was find, found. They find Stevie Branch. His head's in the opposite direction in the creek. He's submerged. Um, they remove Stevie.
from the creek. He's tied the same way. He's new. They go a little bit further downstream, and then they find Chris. And he's nude, tied the same way. The officer had to go, well, as I said, inch by inch. They uh, at least apparently have found uh, all the kids' clothes. Um, they found Michael's Cub Scout shirt. Um, they some of the clothes were actually crammed down into the to the water. Uh, I mean, into the mud. They were pushed down into mud. They were uh, concealed in the mud. Uh, in fact, there was a, a stick, a large stick, that was stuck in the mud, pushed down. And when the officer first got in to start searching, it fell over. And as it came up, one of the kids' shirts or pants or something was on the end of the stick. And you'll see that evidence. The scene itself, there was, you couldn't tell. if There wasn't blood around. It was just, uh, the only thing that indicated that there was something odd was on the, on this ditch, it's a fairly steep bank into the ditch, but then as you get down to the area where Michael Moore is found, there's kind of a flattened off area. And you'll see that on some crime scene diagrams and in the pictures. <coughs> That's, which is lower than the bank, but then higher than the level of the water. And then where Chris and Stevie are found, there's also a bank on the opposite side that is similar. Now on these banks, the officers noted that the, uh, there wasn't the, the normal debris that you'd expect to find there. It was, uh, there was some grass that was all bent down that covered with mud, all scuffed around on the bank. Michael Moore had severe head injuries, uh, fractured skull in several places, and we expect the proof is going to show that he died as a result of drowning, aspirating water. Stevie Branch, we expect the proof is going to show, <coughs> also died of drowning, but he also had uh, multiple skull fractures, and he also had um, some mutilation to the left side of his face. Chris Byers, he also had skull fractures. Chris Byers didn't drown. He bled to death. And he was mutilated in the genital area. The proof's going to show that there were multiple weapons involved, uh, including at least uh, two different sizes of uh, blunt objects, and uh, at least one knife was involved. Now, after this discovery, of course, the, the uh, police did an extensive crime scene search searching this wooded area shoulder to shoulder, inch by inch, found very little uh, in the area. After about a month, or during this month, during the course of this investigation, the officers uh, talked to a number of people, had a number of potential suspects, and the proof's going to show that one of the potential suspects was a person by the name of Damien Eccles. And there was a lady who was uh, uh, a friend of Michael Moore's family. Her son played with Michael Moore. And she had decided more or less that she was going to play detective and see what she could find out. She had moved to an area close to where these people hung out. And she became acquainted with the defendant, Jesse Miss Kelly. And she got the defendant to introduce her to Damien Eccles. And as a result of this, uh, got information about some cult-type activities. Even went to one of these things, I think they may call it an S-bat or S-bot or something like that. 
and um, she went. She told the police. She gave a statement to the police about what she'd seen, and uh, as a result of this, uh, the officers decided that they needed to talk to the defendant uh, to see if he might have any information about Damien Ackles. Mm -hmm. On June the 3rd, 1993, uh, the defendant was asked if he would mind coming down to the police department to uh, talk to the police. I think Officer Mike Allen's the person who went to get him. He brought him in, talked to him for a while, and uh, denied various things. And there were some things that he said that... Uh, Denied, for instance, being involved in any kind of cult-type activities, I believe. And as a result of their conversations, it ended up that um, Inspector Gitchell and Detective Brian Ridge uh, began to question him about, because they, well, they questioned him about information that he might have about this Damien Eccles. Well, ultimately, the defendant admitted to the officers that he was present when this occurred. And at that point, the officers began to tape record the entire statement. And at that point, uh, of course, you will, you will hear everything that the defendant said after that point uh, related to this case. Now, the defendant, through his jury selection process, has asked you questions about false confessions and that kind of thing. Well, we expect the proof's going to show that this defendant confessed, that he was not coerced. Uh, the, we do not contend that the proof's going to show that every word that came out of his mouth was the truth. Uh, we expect the proof's going to show that at times he was confused, at times he was trying to lessen his own involvement, and tell you that he was less involved than he really was. But after you hear the tape recording of his confession, after you consider the other evidence that corroborates the things that he said in his confession, and after you consider the fact that this defendant told the officers that one of the boys had been cut in the face, and only one of them, that one of the boys had been cut in the genital area. After you consider that and the fact that that was not public knowledge, that was information that was only within the police department, I expect that you're going to find that this statement this defendant gave was his statement about what he saw I think you'll find that he lessened his own involvement. And I submit, ladies and gentlemen, that the proof is going to show that this defendant was an accomplice to Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin in the commission of these horrifying murders. And I submit that at the appropriate time, after all of the evidence is in, after all of the witnesses have testified, after all of the exhibits are in, after Judge Burnett has instructed you as to the law in this case, that we will come back before you and we will ask you to return your verdict of guilty on three counts of capital murder. Thank you. Good morning. <coughs> you can bear with me for just a minute. I'll see if I can get this ready here.
May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Dan Stidham. We introduced myself during the jury selection process, the vote dire. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce you to Jesse, the defendant in this matter. I'd also like to introduce you to Mr. Crow. And the lady sitting at the defense table is my secretary and legal assistant, Ms. Crosp. Um, it's not often that I agree with the prosecutor about anything. But I do have to agree that, that this is a horrible and senseless crime, and nobody can change that. But that's not why we're here today. Uh, the purpose of why we're here today is for truth and justice, and to determine whether or not little Jesse Miss Kelly had anything whatsoever to do with this horrible crime. And I would submit to you that the proof is going to show that he did not have anything to do with this crime. The opening statement, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is where we tell you about our case. The prosecutor has told you about his case. He's told you what he intends to prove. And this is our opportunity to show you what we intend to show and demonstrate through our case. I would remind you that the defendant, Mr. and Ms. Kelly, is presumed innocent. And we talked about that extensively during the Vodire examination. He is protected by this presumption of innocence throughout the entire trial. And also, I would like to point out to you, and I want you to think about this through the entire trial, because this is very, very important. It's probably the most important thing you'll hear throughout the trial. The state is required to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And throughout this case, I want you to think about those two words, because they're very important. Reasonable doubt. And now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to show you, uh, give you a preview of our case and what we think that the proof will show in this matter. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this whole case is a sad, sad story. We all know that. But what's even sadder is the way that the West Memphis Police Department decided to investigate this crime, investigate Mr. and Ms. Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the police have told the press and they've told the public that this is the most difficult case that they've ever investigated, the most difficult case in the history of the West Memphis Police Department. Inspector Gitchell gave daily news conferences about the progress in the investigation. He told uh, what information he could about the progress. And uh, there was a very, can everyone see that? Do I need to move it a little bit? Ladies and gentlemen, there was a public outcry. The, the public was demanding that someone be arrested for this crime. And the police department were trying to respond to this tremendous amount of pressure that they were under. In addition to the public outcry, there was a reward. And I believe at one time, the reward actually reached up near thirty-five dollars to $40,000. And that anyone who could provide information leading to the arrest and conviction of the people responsible <coughs> for this horrible crime would get the reward money. I want you to think about that reward money and the reward that was offered because it's gonna play an important factor and an important role throughout the entire course of this trial. Also, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the West Memphis Police Department had what I refer to as Damien Eccles Tunnel Vision. And what I mean by that is, and I think what the proof will show, is that they had Damien Eccles picked out as the person responsible for this crime from day one. I believe the proof will show that they brought him in for questioning either the day the bodies were recovered or the day after. He was their prime suspect from the very, very beginning. And I also think that the proof will show that they literally rounded up anybody and everybody they could and brought them to the West Memphis Police Department and questioned them regarding their knowledge uh, of Damien Eccles. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the, the second part of our defense will be that this statement that Mr. Ms. Kelly gave the West Memphis Police Department, stating that he was present when the murders were occurred, is a false story. 
we believe that what Mr. Miss Kelly told the police was absolutely false. How do we know it was false? Because it was factually incorrect in many, many important areas. The proof will show that Mr. Miss Kelly said this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing, and it was wrong. The police didn't care. They just kept right on interrogating. They glossed right over it. They didn't care that what this kid was telling them was wrong. They knew it was wrong. The second thing that the police will rely on is the fact that only someone who was there could have known these things. And therefore, Mr. Miss Kelly had to have been present. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the evidence will show that everyone in West Memphis knew what had happened to these boys. It was common knowledge throughout the city what had happened, what injuries the boys had sustained, uh, where they were cut. Everything about the crime was common knowledge in West Memphis, Arkansas. The third reason, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that we know that Mr. and Ms. Kelly's statement to the police was false is because of his alibi. The, uh, the evidence will show that not only was Mr. Miss Kelly not in Robin Hood Hills at the time of these homicides, he was in a different county almost 40 miles away at the time these crimes occurred. The third part of our defense <clears throat> is going to be answering the one question that you're going to have in your mind after you hear the factual inconsistencies and the alibi witnesses each get on the witness stand and tell you where Jesse Miss Kelly was on May the 5th, 1993. We're going to answer the question that's in your mind. Why did Jesse Miss Kelly tell this wild story to the West Memphis police about being present when he wasn't? Why did he do that? And we will demonstrate that to you by demonstrating and by evidence that Jesse Miss Kelly has a mental handicap. Second of all, we will demonstrate to you that Jesse Miss Kelly is very suggestible. Thirdly, we will demonstrate to you that the psychological police tactics, the interrogation techniques that were deployed against Mr. Miss Kelly at the time of his statement on June the 3rd, rendered him completely incapable. They, they broke his will. They scared him beyond all measure. And how did they do that? They used a photograph of one of the victims. They showed it to Mr. Miss Kelly and it terrified him. The evidence will show that it terrified him so much that he sat in his chair and just froze. The second thing that they did is they played a tape of a little boy's voice in a real eerie tone that said, nobody knows what happened but me. And it terrified Mr. Miss Kelly. The third thing that they did is they showed him a diagram, a circle. They drew a circle on a piece of paper, and they put three dots in the middle, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, or they said, Mr. Miss Kelly, those three dots are you, Damien, and Jason. And then they made bunches of dots on the outside of the circle, like this, and they said, these dots represent the police. Why don't you come out and help us, and we will help you. The officer's notes will reflect that Jesse Miss Kelly said, I want out. And it was shortly thereafter that, that he gave this statement to the police. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I ask you, throughout the course of this trial, think of two words, reasonable doubt. I think that you will agree with the defense at the end of this trial that there's not just one reasonable doubt. There's going to be many, many reasonable doubts. Thank you for your attention. You all, you all have been in there for about an hour and a half. Do you need a recess, the jury? Short recess? I see one head nodding yes and others no. Let's take about a five minute recess. You all can use the two rooms back here, the two rooms. There's a jury room and then a conference room, and there are two restrooms back there. Your Honor, I need to take up the additional motion and change it if I could. What is it? Can't believe it. Huh? It's a motion to eliminate. For what? 
failed to mention it earlier on the mic, so it's regarding the introduction of testimony against the co-defendants in this case, against Mr. Huskell. I think we need to get a ruling on that before they call the first one. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not following your question. Now, John, I'm going to find more. I can as well as trying to get everything done. Talking about a motion in limine to exclude any evidence against Mr. Eccles and Mr. Baldwin and that in our case in chief. And what we're referring to is basically fiber evidence, hair evidence, or statements that Mr. Eccles may have made regarding his involvement. We would submit that that's irrelevant. It is relevant. It's prejudicial and not probative. And we'd ask that they not be permitted to introduce that evidence. Your Honor, our position is that he's, the position of the defense is that there's nothing to corroborate the confession. Well, we submit that all of this evidence tends to corroborate what he says. When he says Damien Eccles is involved, we ought to be able to put on proof to corroborate that statement. If he says Jason Baldwin's involved, we ought to be able to put on proof to corroborate that statement. Okay, well, that's kind of difficult for me to rule in limine on right now. What I'm going to suggest is that you have a specific objection at the time they tender evidence of that nature, then make it and approach the bench, and then I'll rule on it individually. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is what apparently gets up from the net. It says Chris. Well, I don't know where that microphone's on right down there. It's on. It's on. Y'all doing all right? Okay. Did y'all work something out? It's all right with me. This is for those three. No, he's with the man. He's
if you want to lose yours, uh, mine's fine. I've got enough money for 22 now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to go ahead and lose yours, you can lose yours. Yeah. Yeah. He was kind of concerned about the money and the circumstances in which he had done his church. Uh, uh, Recognize that bicycle? Yeah. All right. And whose bicycle was that? Stevie's. All right. How long have you had that? About two weeks. Your Honor, we would offer State's Exhibit 4. Any objection? No objection. Marty may be received without objection. show you what I've marked for identification purposes in States Exhibit 3 and ask if you can identify that. That's my son's, David. And was that a uh, fairly recent photograph of His it? second grade picture. Your Honor, we would offer States Exhibit 3. All right, it may be received without objection. You may exhibit to the jury. Approximately when was it when you first found that Stevie was missing? At 9.25. All right. And how did you discover that? My husband came to pick me up from work and went and called the police. All right. And did you make a report to the officer? Mm hmm Okay. I don't have any further questions at this time, Your Honor. Your Honor, is it okay for me to address the witness from here? I'm sure. sure. weaving my way through all the amazing. Can you see him? Can you see your man? Um, can you um, what time did your son get home from school that day on May the 5th? What time did he go to school? What time did he get home? Uh, we got home around 2.55. Did you pick him up? Yeah. Okay. Did he skip school that day? Did he what? Did he skip school that day? No. He was at school the entire day? Mm -hmm. Um. Ma'am, there was a time when you were upset with the West Memphis Police Department, isn't that correct? Sir? I said there was a time when you were upset with the police department, was there not? Uh, yes, I was. And you also made a statement that you would be mad at them until the day you die, and you were mad because you were out there doing their job? Did you tell the commercial appeal that, those words? I did make that statement at one time. Why did you feel that way? Um... I felt like they didn't start searching when they should have. So you, you feel like they had a slow response? Uh, no, they did. They showed response, but I had wished they would have started earlier than what they did. I have no further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Wait, Wait a second. Wait a second. Ms. Hobbs, I've got a <coughs> were, were you in the courtroom when, when the opening statements were given? Yes, sir. All right. Were you aware prior to, the, to today, and although I didn't go into a lot of specifics about the injuries, were you aware of, of what injuries, specific injuries the boys had had? No. Hey, nobody's told you? No. Hey, did you heard any uh, information that was accurate as to what injuries the boys had? As to what now? Did you hear any information, any rumors or anything that were accurate as to the injuries the boys had? Uh-uh. Okay. So 
So before today, you didn't know what the injuries were? No, other than at the time of the funeral, I knew that his face had been messed up pretty okay. bad, the at left the side of, of his funeral. face. Okay. And that was because you could see his face? Yeah, on his face it was okay. messed up, the only thing I could do. I don't have any further questions. You may stand down. You're excused from the rule. You may remain in the courtroom if you care to, or you're free to leave. Were you in the group that was sworn this morning? Okay. I will apostrophe, capital T I N G E R. Am I saying the name right? Yes. Okay. If you want to use this one, this one. Would you state your name and address for the court and jury? Uh, Deborah Otinger, 1309 Goodwin Avenue, West Memphis, Arkansas. Right. Ms. Otinger, I want to direct your attention to May the 5th, 1993, the day that the three boys disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you at home that day? Yes, sir. Did you, did you see the boys? Yes, sir. <coughs> All right, about what time was it when you uh, first saw them? Around six, close to six. Okay. And what were they doing? They were in my yard. Okay, were they walking or? One was walking and one was on a bike. Okay, how many boys were there? Two, two there at the time. There were two? Mm -hmm. All right. And um, when they were doing that, whatever they were doing, uh, did you see them later? No, sir. Okay. All right, do, do you know the boys? Did you know them? No, sir. Okay. Uh, what, what exactly did you see the boys doing? One rode the bike through my yard and I had just planted a tree and uh, he had rode right by it and that was it. They were just going through my yard. Okay. That was it. Okay. And how many boys did you say that you saw? Two at the time. We were leaving to go to my mother's. Okay. Let me, I may just be confused. Let me show you this and okay. ask you. Mm -hmm. Is that yours? Yes. So would you mind reading over that for a minute? Yes, sir. Okay. Was that your statement? Yes, sir. All right. I'm a little confused. Uh, in the statement, you mentioned three boys. Right. One had come around the side of the street, the street where Goodwin Avenue is, yeah. okay. and Goodwin Circle. Yes, sir. All right. There were all right. three. I tell you what. Let's do it. I want to show you um, State Exhibit 101, and Mr. Sidham, do you have any objection to 101? That's the aerial photograph. I have an objection to that. All right, if you could. Are you offering 101? Yes. All right, it may be received without objection. All right, you If you could step down and look at this photograph and, and see if you can recognize the area. You recognize this area? And with this being uh, okay. North 14. This is 14. Mm -hmm. This is Goodwin Circle. Right, I'm right here. All right, would you circle that and put your initials with that? Mm -hmm. All right, now if you could, and let me get this corner so you can point with that, the jury. If you could show the jury where you saw the boys, uh, okay. the two together and then the one. The two are right here going through. Right here there's a sidewalk. They cut through my yard right here and the one was right here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did were you later able to identify who the boys were? 
Yeah, I, I actually knew one of them because one of them's. Um, one of them's a little uh, brother had asked him on my lawn. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, one of them's little uh, brother had asked him on my lawn <coughs> earlier in the beginning about the summertime. Okay. Do you know which of the boys that was that you knew? Byers. Which little Byers boy? Okay. I want to show you. Been introduced to Stacy to the one and ask if you recognize him. Yes, sir. Right. Is that the Byers boy? That yes, it is. Okay. And is this one of the boys that you saw? Yes, sir. <laughs> and about what time was this? Close to six. We were supposed to be at my mother's at six for dinner. All right, and where were they when the, you last saw them? That was it, right, right there. there. We, were, we were getting in the vehicle to leave. <laughs> All right, do you know what, what this area the kids call this area in here? Robin Hood. Okay. I don't have any further questions. I have no questions of this witness, Your Honor. All right, you're free to go or welcome to remain in court. Thank you. Would you state your name and occupation for the jury? Regina Meek, police patrolman, West Memphis Police Department. How long have you been with the police department? Nine years. Uh, patrolman Meek, I want to direct your attention to May the 5th, 1993. Uh, at some time around 8 o'clock, were you dispatched to 1400 East Barton? Yes, sir, I was. And what time did you arrive? Uh, around 8.10. Right. And uh, whose residence was 1400 East Barton? A buyer's residence. <laughs> and when you were at that residence, uh, what did you find when you got there? Okay. When I got there, I found a mother and father worried about their missing son, their eight-year-old son. And while you were there, did you have contact with any other parents? Yes, sir. Um, Mrs. Moore came and knocked on the door while I was taking the report from Mr. and Mrs. Byers and uh, told me that her son was with the Byers boy and also Steve Branch was with them. She had solved them earlier. All right. And uh, did you take a formal report from her at that time? No, sir, I did not. I, I did finish the Byers report, and when I left there, I could not relocated her. She was still looking for her son, and I found her again around 9.24. Okay. All right, now after taking the report, uh, what efforts, if any, did you make to try to locate uh, these children? Okay. I had been advised by Mrs. Moore the last time anyone saw them, they were going toward a wooded area. Uh, okay. Of course, it was nicknamed Robin Hood by the children. Um, it was pointed out to me there was two entrances, and since uh, the they had told me that uh, a couple of people who went into the entrance off of Goodwin, I went down to Macaulay. Okay. Now, if you could, you take this corner and refer, directing your attention to State's Exhibit 101, would you point to the jury, point out to the jury this area that's known as Robin Hood and the two entrances? Okay. <coughs> Let's see. All right. uh, this area here is Robin Hood. Uh, this is Macaulay Street here. This is a pipe that runs across the bio here. Okay, now these are, there's trails that pass all throughout here. They told me that uh, some of the people had came in from this side, from over here. So I came in from here and went down to the pipe. And these pipes where I stopped. <laughs> that area about what time was it it was turning dark I didn't didn't look at my watch to see what time it was but it was turning it was well on its way to dark right and <coughs> was there any particular thing about the uh, the conditions that you noted yes sir um, I went when I went down the hill to the pipe of course the weeds were extremely high mosquitoes were tremendous I was breathing in mosquitoes it was so bad and I decided at that time that three eight-year-old boys would not be staying in the woods with mosquitoes that bad. And I turned around, went back to my vehicle, and uh, decided to start checking buildings and other areas. All right. And did you do that? Yes, sir. And how uh, long did you continue to search? Um, I went back to the police department around 11.15 or 11.20. All right. And is that when, when your... Uh, that's when my part of it stopped, yes, sir. When did your shift actually end? A quarter to 11. Right. It was whenever... The rest of the officers okay. finish their shift. I don't have any further questions at this time. Any questions? You're free to go. Thank you. Could you state your name and occupation for the jury? 
John Moore, Patrolman, City of West Memphis. Patrolman Moore, I want to direct your attention to May the 5th, 1993. Um, were you on duty that night? Yes, sir. And approximately uh, 9.25 or so, did you uh, respond to Catfish Island? Yes, sir. All right. And what did you find when you got there? Uh, I met there with uh, Miss Hobbs and her husband, and I believe she had a child with her. She stated that one of her, uh, that her son, Steve Branch, was, was missing. Okay. And did you make, start an incident report uh, yes, about that? Yes, start an incident report. All right. After taking this report uh, from her, did you participate <coughs> in any of the search? Yes, sir. All right, and what involvement did you have in doing that? What did you do? Okay, I went down down the street from Catfish Island to an area, and I met with uh, Mr. Bowers, and he and I searched an area off Goodwin Street. Okay. <coughs> Let me give you this point and refer your attention to State's Exhibit 101, and ask you to point out uh, this area that you're talking about. Okay. Get this out and be back over this way. See, here's the truck stop. Get this out and it's here. And this is where I met with Ms. Hobbs. And I left there and went up here and went back over to the state industry here where I met with Mr. Bowers. And it was dark and I believe his wife left to go get him a flashlight. He and I, with my flashlight, went back in this area and searched for the boys. And we crossed up in here and back here. Then I went back to here. Okay. Um, what were the conditions out there where you were searching? There was some water there, and there were a few tracks, but none of the bicycle tracks looked fresh in the area that we were at. <coughs> were there other people searching? Uh, there was other people there, but there was no one out there searching while I was there. Okay, I'm not talking about that particular area, but I'm talking about... Uh, were you aware of other people searching for the kids. I believe Mr. Bowers said the other family members were out searching okay. for them also. <laughs> I don't have any further questions at this time. No questions, Your Honor. I your excuse from the rule and you're free to go. Ryan, would you state your name and where you live for the jury? Uh, my name is Ryan Clark. I live at 1400 East Barton. Right. Um, and what is your relationship to uh, Christopher Byers? Uh, he was my brother. Uh, How old are you, Ryan? I'm 14. <clears throat> Do you go to school? Yes, sir. I, I go to uh, West Memphis Christian. Okay. Ryan, I want to um, direct your attention to May the 5th, uh, the day that your brother disappeared. Did you help in looking for him? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Where all did, what all did you do <coughs> in looking for him? Uh... We, uh, I walked, I walked around in the woods looking for him, okay. and uh, that's about all. Okay. All right, when did you first start looking for him? When you first started looking for him, were you with anybody? <coughs> uh, yes, sir. I was with my friend Britt Smith. Okay. All right. And about what time did you get with your friend Britt Smith? I don't know. It was dark. I didn't pay attention. It was dark. Okay, that's fine. <coughs> Was there anybody else that that you were with, well, or had been with? Uh, Britt's uh, sister was help looking, and, and uh, her boyfriend Richie Masters was looking, and uh, his cousin Robbie. I don't know if guys last name. Okay. All right. Now, in the when you said you looked in the woods. <coughs> I want you to look at what I've got up here in States Exhibit 1. Look over that picture and see if you recognize that area. <coughs> you do recognize that? Mm -hmm. Alright, if you could take this corner and if you need to get out of your chair or swing around, whatever you need to do, and point for the jury the area where you, where you were looking. <coughs> this is the interstate. <coughs> this is the truck stop at Blue Beach. We look, we look, we look, uh, we look, we looked right over here, and uh, the other day we walked over here and looked. 
Yeah. When was that? You said the other day? The next, well, the, well, it was the same day. But what, in the nighttime that we were looking, uh -huh. we were looking over here with the truck stop and the All right. Yeah. Do you see this right? How did you get across this big ditch? There's a pipe right there. Okay. And which which woods were you looking in? In the nighttime? Mm-hmm. We were looking right, right along here. Okay. Did you ever go on the north side of the of the ditch? Um, yeah, we, we uh well I didn't. Friend Richie did. He uh they ran over here and they ran all the way down here to look right here while we were over here. Okay. But you didn't yourself didn't go on the north side of the pipe looking. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> what is this area, all this area called? Robin Hood. What are all these lines and things on here? Do you know what those are? Motorcycle trails. <laughs> when, um, after your, uh, your brother, uh, wasn't at home. Were you at home when he left, or do you know? Uh, I was at court. Okay. After you got back from, were you, what? Why were you at court? Uh, <coughs> I was riding my three wheeler and uh, on the street, and uh, the woman was in the car, and she came flying past me because uh, she, we thought we she made her mad or something. Or we made her mad or something, and she came flying by us, and the cops saw her, and uh. He gave her a ticket for a reckless driving. You were there to testify? Yes, sir. Okay. After you got home from court, uh, was your brother at home? Um, mm -mm. All right. <clears throat> After you found that he wasn't at home, did you did you do anything to look for him there around that, that area? Yes, sir, I did. I, uh, I looked around on Wilson Street because uh, uh, my dad said that he went to his uh, friend Steve uh, Branch. You know. okay. Did you look any on North 14? Um, yeah, I went down the street. Did you find anything down the street? Uh, uh, uh not really. All right. Did you find a skateboard? Yeah, I, yeah, I found I found the skateboard, but I, I ain't never seen it before. Oh, you had never seen it? Oh, okay. All right, while you were, uh, you and Britt were searching uh, in the woods, did you hear anything? Uh, yes, we heard some uh, splashing. We heard, uh, well, it was me and Britt, we were walking by the, uh, it wasn't nowhere near where the where they found them, but it was, uh, it was down the, uh, by, it was by, there's a bridge, we were right up about there. Mm -hmm. And we heard some splashing and everything, so I started yelling and stuff at them. And uh, I told my friend Britt when I count to three, run. And after that, we took off running. Okay. I don't have any further questions at this time. Ryan, do you also remember telling the police that you heard somebody rustling around in the weeds about the same time you heard the splashes? Yes, I did. And you remember what time that was? No, I don't. The time you told the police it was? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Was it about nine o'clock? Was it after dark? It was dark. You remember what time it got dark that day? Uh, I don't know. It was, it was kind of late because it was in the summertime. Okay. Um, did you see anybody running from the the, the area or the scene? I didn't see nothing, but uh, I heard something. You couldn't tell who it was or what it was just by the sound? Well, it sounded like somebody was running across it. it. sounded like somebody was running from us or something or running at us. No further questions. Would you show on the map where it was, where you were, you heard the rustling and the weeds? <laughs>
about right here somewhere. Okay, to take the corners of all the jurors, you'll be able to see where you're from. Right, right about right here somewhere. Right here. Okay, and that's on the south side of the big ditch, is that right? Yeah, the splashing was, you know, over here. Okay. <laughs> Right, you may stand down. And you're excused from the rule. And you're welcome to remain in the courtroom or you're free to go. Officer Allen, would you state your name and occupation for the jury? Mike Allen. I'm a detective sergeant with the West Memphis Police Department. How long have you been with the West Memphis Police Department? Uh, since uh, May of 88. And how long have you been in law enforcement total? Uh, total since 1981. Uh, Detective Allen, I want to direct your attention to uh, May the 6th, 1993. Uh, what part, if any, did you play in the search for uh, Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Chris Byers? The morning of the 6th, uh, we had a meeting uh, at the detective division, and as soon as we sat down for our morning meeting, we were informed of the missing youths. And we, at that time, uh, were given photographs and some inf general information on them, and we went out looking. Uh, I, in particular, was assigned to check vacant houses, and uh, that was my duties for that day. All right. And were various detectives given various duties as far as search different for areas, Different areas of search, yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> if you uh, could, do, uh, do you recognize State's Exhibit 2? Yes, sir. <clears throat> All right. If you could you take this corner and if you could show the jury the areas where uh, you searched that day. Mm -hmm. The areas I searched was uh, what we call our north east section of uh, West Memphis. Uh, Detective yeah. Allen, if you could step back a little bit so the jurors down here would be able to see better. And, and speak up a little bit too, okay. please, Mike. This area right here is the northeast section of West Memphis. Uh, the, the three boys that uh, were reported missing lived in this general area, and so I searched uh, vacant houses in the general northeast section of West Memphis that day. All right. What is that area bounded by? What major streets <coughs> bound that area? We make up from Broadway north. Or where is Broadway on the map? Jersey? Broadway. May not be familiar with that. Broadway is this, uh, in the center of this, this darker line in the center here that runs, uh, it runs uh, east and west. Uh, this is Broadway Street here. This right here is Seventh Street that runs runs north and south here. Uh, this uh, area in here is considered the northeast section of West Memphis on on a ward map here. All right, and and what areas again did you search in that area? I searched uh, this this the major area here is made up of resident it's residential neighborhoods in the northeast section of town, and I searched. Uh, abandoned houses, uh, storm drains, uh, just drove over uh, this area here. Okay, you can retake yeah. the stand. Detective Allen, about what time did you begin your search efforts that morning, approximately? Approximately a few minutes after 8 o'clock. Okay. And uh, at some point uh, in your searching, did you receive uh, some dispatch of some need to go uh, to another area? I was informed uh, to go to the area of the end of, it's West Macaulay, okay. the north end of West Macaulay, the dead end. Let me put the state 101 back up here. And if you could, again, take the corner and show to the jury the uh, area where you then went to start.
uh, I was informed uh, I was informed by an officer uh, over the radio to come to this area uh, in regards uh, to something that had been found. All right, what area are you referring to? This is right here, this street right here is West Macaulay. Uh, I heard an officer check out on the very north end of West Macaulay, which would be right here. This is the 10 mile bio here, this larger ditch here, drainage ditch. I was, uh, After I heard you another officer check out right there at the very dead end of North Macaulay. Mm -hmm. That, that they had some information from somebody that was on foot. Okay. After you got there, uh, where did you go? I walked in behind another officer across this, there is a pipe right here, across this pipe. All right, let me, let me stop you right there. Now, to get to the pipe, what, I mean, is it just flat level ground or how is it to get to the pipe? There is a, from the road here, uh, you go over a little, there's like a, a mound of dirt, then there's a, this is a, a, a sloping hill here on the side of the ditch. Down to the pipe? Yes, sir. All right. And then the pipe goes over the 10 mile bow here uh, where I was uh, shown an area in the woods here. Okay. And is that the, the area of the woods, for the record, uh, immediately east of Blue Beacon and that, that, that pond there? This is Blue Beacon here. Uh, this is a, a pond behind Blue Beacon and <coughs> directly east in the location right, right about here, approximately here. All right. All right, you can retake the stand. When you got to that area, what, if anything, unusual did you see in the, in the creek? I was pointed out a, I observed what appeared to be two small tennis shoes floating uh, in, the, in the creek. Now, after seeing these tennis shoes, what did you do? I went... Uh, we were on top of an, a top of a bank there. The I would say 10, 15 foot down to the, where the creek was. Uh, I went to an area where I felt I could cross, uh, which I, I, I crossed and went around uh, to the area where these tennis shoes were in, in the water. Right. And uh, did you get in the water? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Um, and after getting in the water, what did you find? My intentions were to reach, get into the water and reach for the tennis shoe, at which time uh, when I got into the water, I, I, felt, a, I felt an object in the water. Uh, I raised my right foot up and the body floated to the surface of the water. Now, after making this discovery, what did you do? I I got back out of the water, stood right there. Uh, the other investigator that showed up at that time called for uh, in Inspector Gitchell and the, the rest of the detectives to come to that area. All right. And then was uh, a crime scene search done of that area that afternoon? Yes, sir. All right. How long were you there at that at the scene? It was about one, it was, I would say, I think the radio log reflect 114. I was roughly there from 114 until approximately 830 that, that evening. All right. <clears throat> I want to show you a photograph that's been marked for identification purposes at State's Exhibit 9 and ask if you recognize that photograph. Yes, sir. Does that photograph fairly and accurately portray uh, the area at the time that this occurred? Yes, sir. Your Honor, we would offer State's Exhibit 9. No objection, Mike. It may be received without objection. You may exhibit. 
Conway, Detective Allen, step down and yes. exhibit it for the jury. <coughs> Detective Allen, if you would, if you would show on the uh, photograph to the jury the the pipe that you crossed and the trail. Uh, but this right here is the is the very north end of West Macaulay, where I, I parked my unit. Uh, uh, walk down this little trail here. There's a little embankment here across this pipe. Uh, Mike, if you could uh, hold the photograph in front of you and turn it so all the jurors could see it, and then point to it like that so they can all see. Okay. Don't turn it like that. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm looking at it upside down. This. Can everybody see this? This is West Macaulay. This is the this is the uh, trail that leads up to the pipe that crosses the ten mile valley. Uh, there's another trail that runs up along uh, this patch of woods, and I was directed into the woods through uh, about uh, right in through there to where. Uh, walk a little ways into the woods to this creek that runs uh, more or less in this direction here. Uh, but it's it's in the woods covered with the trees in this aerial photograph. Okay, you can retake this thing. Have you made a tip to the jury on it? Yes, you may. <laughs> now I want to show you two photographs, Mark. For identification purposes, the states exhibits 10 and 11 can ask if you can identify those photographs. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, do those photographs fairly and accurately portray uh, the scene as it appeared to you that day? Yes, sir. All right, Your Honor, we would offer states exhibits uh, 10 and 11. No objection, Your Honor. All right, they may be received without objection. Beginning with states exhibit 10, Detective Allen. Is, is that picture, was that picture taken before or after the boys were found? This was, was taken before. All right. Now, what are you doing there? Uh... At that point, I was attempting to cross this, this small creek ditch. Um, at, and I had leaned the, I had leaned over to that tree, thinking I could grab a hold of that tree and, and pull myself over. Uh, I didn't make it. Is that I, State's Exhibit 11? Yes, I, I ended up in the water there. This is me. Can I exhibit the computer? Yes, you may. Now I want to hand you what I've marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 12 and ask if you can identify that. <coughs> this is the can you identify it? Yes, sir. Does that photograph fairly and accurately portray the scene as it appeared to you that day? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I would offer State's Exhibit 12. No objection, Your Honor. All right, it may be received without objection. And what is depicted in State's Exhibit 12? This is the first body that I that I discovered uh, at the scene. Is that Michael Moore? Yes, sir. I exhibit to the jury, Your Honor. I want to show you what's marked for identification purposes as States Exhibit 31 and ask if you can identify that photograph. Yes, sir. Does that photograph fairly and accurately portray the scene as it appeared to you that day? Yes, sir. Your Honor, we would offer States Exhibit 31. No objection, Your Honor. All right, it may be received without objection. All right, Detective Allen, is that your hand and feet? Yes, sir, feet? it is. And what are you pointing to uh, in the water? That's the location that I had, had uh, found the first body. All right. Now, in, was there anything 
All right, where the first body was found, were the other bodies found upstream or downstream? Downstream. Downstream. And was there anything about the surface of the water uh, that was different uh, upstream from, or where the first body was found in upstream as opposed to downstream? It was clear in this area, in this photograph here, than it, than it was downstream. All right, what do you mean clear? The surface of the water was clear. It was uh, a lot, as you can see on down here, There's it's a lot thicker with uh, debris and uh, sticks, bark, just uh, leaves, leaves debris, like yes. No, sir. On the on the side, which you can say blue beacon or Memphis side. On the on the blue beacon side, it was a steep bank. Uh, what I mean by steep, I mean straight up steep on on the side. On the other side, there was like a, a like a uh, plateau or, or uh, flat flat side. Right. And uh, where was this flattened area in relation to where Michael's body was found? It was right off of the flat area. Okay. In, in, into the deep. Was there did you was there anything unusual about that flattened area that, that you observed? It appeared to have been it was clean. It was when you say it was clean, what do you mean? It looked as if uh Say you just you had a big area of, of of dirt. It appeared that just a lot of, of scuffing marks, like someone's feet were just doing this number, and then but there was were no there were no impressions of, of that you could actually see of any particular shoe or anything in this given area here. It appeared that it appeared that it had been smoothed uh, like watered down with a water hose. Uh, it just was. It was it was clean to be in that in that section of the woods. Now, was there some grass on this flattened area? In parts of yes. Sir, and did you notice anything about the grass? Uh, just the, that the mud on the grass. Mud on the grass. Yes, sir. Was the grass standing up? It was. Uh, to my best knowledge, it looked like mud had been. It was on top of the grass. It was like smushed down. Okay. Now, the did you was there some additional crime scene search done the next day or or late that afternoon? Yes, sir. All right. What was done in the in that entire wooded area? There were uh, there were nu numerous things done. There was a a search made. Uh, I say inch by inch. Uh, there was a, a, a how, search. How was that conducted? When you say it was conduct, it was done inch by inch. What do you well, mean? Well, it's it's quite a large area. We mm -hmm. took all the detectives out uh, in that area. Uh, we started roughly from the interstate, the patch of woods next to the interstate. We walked it shoulder to shoulder. Uh, about we walked within hands distance. We kind of lined up where we were actually touching each other's hands down a row, and we walked in to the woods. We walked from the from one side of the woods to the other side. Then we got and kind of made a chain down another section, hand to hand, and walked back. We we basically did you do that for the in, in, the, the entire, entire wooded section. Of 
I don't have any further questions at this time. <laughs> Officer Allen, who all was out there that day or when you discovered the first body? How many officers were there? When I first discovered the body, <coughs> was uh, there was a, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Steve Jones, a juvenile officer. Um, Denver Reed with the search and rescue, uh, George Phillips with the West Memphis Police Department, and uh, Lieutenant Diane Hester of the West Memphis Police Department. So there's just one search sandbagged off and... May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> Officer Allen, uh, uh, I'm sure I'm pointing the direction. That is the blue beacon truck board. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. And this is the pipe that, that uh, the children neighborhood used to cross over the bayou. Is that there's, correct? There's a pipe across the bayou. Okay. Is this approximately where the, the bodies were recovered? Yeah. Let the jury see. Okay, them. I'm sorry. This, from this area of shot, I assume that this is the dish that we were referring to this is showing through the trees here that you might be able to see a little bit of it. It's, it's heavily wooded, uh, but uh, it would be, I would say, roughly somewhere in this given area. This okay. uh, from an aerial shot, that's my best. These little things here, those are are semi trucks, 18 wheeler rigs, tractor trailer rigs? Yes, they are. And um, could you estimate, I know it would be an estimate, about how far it is from, say, the bayou to the interstate and in yards, football fields? In mean, football fields, I would say roughly 200 yards, a little more. How about from this side? of this field to this side over here to the truck wash. How, how far would you say that is? Mm. I know it's an estimation. 70, I'd just be guessing 75 yards, I don't, I don't know. So we're not talking about More. a real, you can have a seat, thank you. We're not talking about a real huge area, are we, a wooded area? It's, it's fairly, fairly good size. About 500 yards, about 100 yards approximately. Why I I don't I'm trying to compare it with with a with a football field as you mentioned. Uh, but for the jurors, it may be this. These yes. being uh, eighteen wheel trucks, they can sort of get an idea about how far the distance is too. Yes, sir. If you weren't if you didn't know those were eighteen wheel trucks, you probably wouldn't be able to make that. I guess these things here are, are trucks moving down. Yes, the sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They get an idea from the. Thank you, Officer Allen. I'll have you for the question. Detective Allen, I, I neglected to ask you a question. On that flattened off area that you described about the slicked off area, were there leaves on that? No, or, sir. Or were there leaves like there were other in no, other areas? No, there, there might have been several, but it was not, it did not, not look as if the rest of the parts of the woods looked. I don't have anything further. Mm -hmm. Jermaine, stand out. Do you need him further? Would you state your name and occupation for the jury? Yeah, my name is Shane Griffin. I'm a narcotics detective for the West Memphis Police Department. Uh, detective Griffin, I want to direct your attention to May the 6th, 1993. On that date, were you all, at that time also assigned to the narcotics unit? Yes, sir, I was. And, uh, were you called upon to play some part in the search for uh, Michael Moore and Stevie Branch and Chris Byers? Yes, sir, I was. Right. And when did you become involved in, in this search? Um, I usually come at work to work around 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, when I came in, they notified me on the radio that there were three young men missing. And uh, at that time, I started uh, helping and looking for the boys. Were other narcotics officers looking, too? There were several of us out looking. All right. And um, where were you assigned to look? Uh, there were uh, there was a field north of the interstate, uh, north of 55 and 40, that uh, I was in, or that I went and looked in initially. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, is it, if you could look at Exhibit 101 and tell us if that area is shown on there, on that photograph. Yes, sir, it's, it's this field right here, or the, the trees and stuff like this. Uh, somebody called in on the radio said there was a report that they might have been seen over in this area. So it's a huge wooded area and it was uh, a lot of mud and a lot of water and stuff. So it took us a lot of time to go through Were all that. Were you areas. alone or with others? Uh, I started out alone. There were others riding three-wheelers around because back further north there's, there's a huge field out in that area and they were checking the field but I was in the woods. And right, about how long did you spend searching in that area? Uh, in that area I approximately a couple hours with them. And then after you searched that area where'd you go? Um, after that area uh, we got called in and uh, we had a, a search warrant we had to execute and, and that was related to your narcotics yes sir. all right now after after you got through doing that how long did that take to do? uh approximately 30 minutes 45 minutes somewhere along there then after you did that where did you go uh, after we did that just as we were finishing up that's when inspector Gitchell called uh, my captain on the radio and advised us that, uh, that they had been found all right and then where did you go uh at that time we were called to the scene uh, to assist show you where I've marked for identification purposes the state's exhibits 56, 57, and 58 and ask if you can identify those. Yes, sir, I can. All right. Those fairly and actually trade the scene as appeared to you that day? Uh, yes, sir. Hey, Your Honor, we would offer state's exhibits 56, 57, and 58. Are those some that I don't recall? Yes, Was there any? No objection. No objection. All right, they may be received without objection. Uh, Your Honor, may Detective Griffin step down and exhibit the photographs to the jury and explain. Yes, uh, in, the, in picture number 58, we have a pipeline that runs across a 10 mile battle right here. Um, just north of this area right here is the Robin Hood area, the area where the uh, bodies were found. Uh, on this pipeline right here, this is the east side. Um, uh, as we were looking, these are the bicycles that were uh, reported that the boys were riding that day. We found the bicycles right here on the east side of the pipe, about midway in the pipe. Both of them right there, close to each other. And what was the level of the water in relation to the pipe? Uh, the, the water was probably about three or four foot underneath the pipe. And is that where the, at that time, did you, uh, after the bicycles were removed, did you take charge of the bicycles? Uh, yes, sir. I carried one, and I don't really recall who carried the other one. We carried them and received them into evidence. Now, I want to show you, well, let's just do it on the paper. Uh, look at uh, State's Exhibit 101, important to the jury, uh, for the jury, the pipe where the, the area where the bicycles were found. Uh, this is the pipe area right here. See, but take my, take Barbara's pen and circle that area and put your initials there. Those are the bicycles that I pulled out of the bottle. I don't have any further questions. Do you have any questions of this witness, Any reason to keep him here? I see no, Your Honor. You're free to go. Oh, Your Honor, I do that. I'll take it back. I do have a couple more questions. Got it. I don't know. Did you also participate in doing some measurements for uh, a crime scene diagram? Yeah, yes, sir, I did. All right. If if you could look at State's Exhibit 13 and point out the areas that you measured and what those distances were, and take Barbara's pen again and and write on the, there the distances. Okay. 
uh, myself and Detective Durham were uh, took measurements of the area from where the uh, victim's bodies were found. The tree on the east side and the tree on the west side of the bank, which are these two trees right here, were our, our reference points that we used to make the measurements from. The first body was found um, 14 foot 7 inches southeast of the tree or southwest of the tree on the east side of the bank and 10 foot 6 inches southeast of the tree on the west side of the bank. Uh, victim 2 was found straight down the uh, ditch area um, 27 feet south of victim 1 and victim 3 was found 32 foot south of victim 1 uh, in the ditch bank. Can you raise my key pin? Um, Use a clipping real quick. Make sure. <coughs> uh, no, sir, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.